Please. Hello, Matthew. Hey, Matt. Oh, yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Chucky. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew Kachuk. Matthew Kachuk. <laughs> Talk to me. Chucky, are you there? Can you hear me? What's up, guys? Oh, I would die for you. Oh, I would die for this you. This is embarrassing. All right, back off from the microphone. And all of this is embarrassing. We've got a, gen a genuine, bona fide hockey superstar. South Florida has fallen in love with him because he gets the dirty goals. And uh, I thank you for your service, but also I want to reprimand. Yes, the thank you for your service. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I want to it's very brave what you're very, doing. It is brave. <laughs> very, very brave. Yeah, it is brave. Very, yes. Yeah, especially against the Bruins. You seen that forecheck? Brave. They blew up their Rockets. Red Claire. They they blew up their Night. blueprint to get this guy because this guy knows how to play to, uh, you know playoff hockey. He gets you dirty goals. You guys aren't going to embarrass me though by not being a journalistic entity when we talk to him, correct? Oh, shut the hell up, Dan Levitard. Kachuk, you're the best. Yeah. Let's go to Flanny's brother. How do you pronounce your name? <laughs> um, it's Matthew Brandon Kachuk. See, yeah, I, I, told I told you. Hold I told you. You didn't believe me. Jonathan Slaslow said me. it was pronounced Kachuk, and we're like, I've never heard that. They, they don't say that in the arena. They don't say that to Matthew's dad. I've never heard anyone say Kachuk. It's not really a question. He's just shouting at you. Have you heard someone? Is Zaslo making this up? No one in the family history has corrected you. You've been pronouncing your name wrong all your both generations of hockey lives. Oh, no. It sounds pretty good to me. I just tell everyone T silent and however you pronounce it, it's good with us. How surprised are you by what is presently happening? It seemed unclear that you were going to make the playoffs at all. Um, I, I don't think uh, necessarily surprised. Like, to be quite honest, like we just come to the rink today. Today's a practice day. Enjoy it out there. Have some fun. Lots of laughs. Prepare ourselves. Get a workout in. Go home. Do everything we can to be ready for the game tomorrow and go in and try to win. Like, it's not really surprising what's going on. It's just a lot of fun. Like, we're we're not like really treating this as a series either like we know we're ahead but like we're coming in tomorrow and we're trying to win like we're not it's really a simple very simple plan we have for it for us and it's just been a ton of fun like on the bench we're just trying to really enjoy it all sam bennett almost stole your signature move uh in game three with the between the legs shot is it is it like everybody's playing loose everybody's relaxed this is the playoffs like this is a high pressure situation uh are you guys relaxed for, for, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he went he went through the legs with two or three minutes left in a playoff game when it was tied. Like, I think that just shows you everything right there. Like, we're just trying. I mean, it was probably the best way he could have tried to score. Or goalie made a great save, but like that's just our team right now. Like, we're having fun. Like, we're no, but the the, the people were critical about uh, it being too flashy for that game situation. Uh, I think as somebody, I've scored a few of those before. Sometimes that's the best way and the only way to score. So. I, don't, I think that was a good. It was a good move. How much fun is it playing on this line with Benny and Nick Cousins? Because anytime you guys get on the ice, I feel like you're just dominating the other line. Yeah, it's fun. Like we all have a similar mindset. I wouldn't say we're similar players, but we think it the same way. Like when we don't have the puck, we're going to be a dog on the bone to get it back. Like we're hunting the forecheck. We're trying to get back as fast as possible. We're trying to, I mean, we're playing against great players on the other team. We're trying to limit everything that they have and like not just limit them, but we're trying to score and trying to produce as well. So um, we're trying to finish their D. Like it is, when it when it comes to playoffs, like you got to remember it's a series too. So like what you do in game one and game two and game three and game four, like we saw in the Boston series, like everything our line did or our team did, like, it seemed to keep evolving, evolving. And then you see it for the game seven. Um, you see it like happening game seven where maybe there's D, those D don't want to go back for pucks in overtime, which led to the goal. So it's it's stuff like that. And I think that's uh, kind of the identity of our team and the identity of our line right now. 
So you've had a, repu- uh, a reputation entering this season as someone that gets under the skin of opposing players, and I think uh, the Boston series was a good example. You're mixing it up with the goalie over there. And carrying over this season, and specifically that Boston series, it almost looked like Toronto went out of their way to put bodies on you very early on to try to set a tone. Did you feel like they were doing something a little different, like you were starting to pay for stuff that you did the previous series? Uh, I'm not sure. I know that teams make adjustments and stuff, but um... – I, I don't think like that hasn't been what Toronto's doing all year. So if they want to do it now, I think that like just kind of works to our advantage. Uh, um, so we'll see what happens in the game tomorrow. But um, the both series have been have been challenging. Both are great teams. Um, but if Toronto, if they change up their game for that, I think that works to our advantage. So um, playoffs are all about the little advantages that you can create, and it starts with your play on the ice. And um, like you brought about brought up the chirping i mean it's it just that just happens in playoffs and what guys say to each other it's just just kind of what happens so um you know it's it's intense and when the stakes get higher and higher everybody wants to win that much more yeah you, and you kind of live for that stuff too you can see that you're kind of enjoying it and for whatever reason you can almost point to that moment as where things kind of turned in that previous series with boss and something that i can't really describe well is the absence of something and everyone expected the core four of Toronto to continue to be a matchup problem like they've historically been for damn near everyone in the NHL. I'm not asking for industry secrets here, but what are you doing to neutralize those four guys in particular? It's almost unrecognizable. Well, they're they're unreal players and they have been since they've been in the league and since they've all been on Toronto together and have have um kind of provided problems for everybody they've played against and, and continue to do for us like they're they're real threats out there but um for us to shut down those guys and their team we have to do it like there's not just one d pair or one centerman like everybody has to play together and like all five guys in the ice have to be close together and support in case one of those guys like they're great one-on-one players so say you know, one of their guys beats me. Like I need Benny there to be covering for me. And then if something happens, like Cuzzy needs to be behind them or the D like it's, it's, that's kind of been like the key to our success too, is, is like everybody is gelled and like playing to this identity. That's, that's hard to play against. So um, I think for them, they're unreal players and they'll continue to, to, you know, play the way that, you know, they have in their, in their careers in the series, those guys on Toronto. So it's up to us and a challenge for us to be able to stop them and hopefully we can continue it tomorrow. Matthew, you know how hard it is to win playoff hockey. You know how tough these ridiculous, insane human beings skating around on swords around you who are tougher than most human beings. Uh, You know that it is really difficult to surpass the pain threshold to be as great as you are at hockey and through, I don't know how many of those teeth are real. I don't know what happens to the human mouth during hockey games, but I see you smiling. You love that you're an asshole that bothered Boston. You love that. Like you're being all polite hockey guy, but that team had a historic record and you bothered them because you're an irritant. You're annoying in front of the goals, dirty goals, dirty goals taught by your father. You're an asshole. It's delightful. I love you. Oh, I appreciate it, I guess. But no, I think that uh, I think that we uh, like just talking about the Boston series, like it was really refreshing for us to be able to like we we really did limp into the playoffs. Like we won a lot to get in, but like getting in by one point, like as an eight C, like that's playing to the bitter end. So I think when it came into the Boston series, like we know they had 40 or 50 more points than us. We know they've had this record breaking season and all these great players that they have and traded for at the trade deadline. Like they were best team in the league. Right. And I think what helped us out a lot is going into that series. It's zero, zero. Like there's no records anymore. There's nothing like it's all even. And we can start from scratch and we can start from this game and, even though we lost game one, I, I felt we played really, really well in the first bit of the game that I think surprised them in the sense like these guys aren't just like these guys are for real. Like these guys are a playoff team. And I think that's what helped us and just continue to wear them down, wear them down, wear them down and ultimately got that game seven win. What sparked you guys more for this late se- regular season into the playoff push? Was it Maurice laying into you guys? on the on the bench in Toronto or your dad calling the team soft on the radio? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, 
I'm going to go with C. I'll go with Lion King coming in. Uh, yeah. In yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he was unreal to get us into the playoffs and played great at the start. And then obviously we know what Bob's done since he's come back. He's, he's been our most, our best and most important player. And uh can't say enough about both goalies. They've been unreal. Paul Maurice said that uh, the players have taken over the bench as in, the coaching staff doesn't have to make any adjustments. The players can react and adjust on the ice. How important is it for a player like yourself to have that trust from the coaching staff? Very important. I don't think it's just given and like that's earned and that's shown over the course of the year. Like this isn't, I know we've been in the playoffs for a couple of weeks now, but we've been playing playoff hockey for months. So like, this isn't all new to us, like come to the rink and these must wins or the, the big time games like this is just how it is for us and how it's been. So, um, you know, I think there's obviously they're back there and when they see stuff, they let us know. But I think when when he says that, I think it speaks more of like we know the type of hockey we have to play. And if there's a shift or two or three or a few minutes span of us not playing that, like we know that's not us and we're able to adjust and get back to what's making us successful and and I think that's been really good. And we have a lot of guys on the team that, you know, we've got a mix of older guys and younger guys. But going through this, like, we've gained a lot, a lot of important, like, valuable lessons this year that are hopefully going to pay off and, and have paid off to this point. Can you explain to me from a marketing standpoint and fame standpoint, playing in this market, how famous are you locally? Uh, if you, you'd be dominating Canada in fame if you were doing this for Canadian teams. Is the sport international enough that your fame in South Florida translates to you walking around okay, or do people bother you? No, I can definitely walk around okay uh, down in Florida. It's it's a, It's different than and how it was in Calgary, for sure. I mean, like you're playing on a Tuesday night in a regular season in Calgary and, um, you know, everybody knows who you are wherever you go afterwards or, you know, whatever. But since we've made this crazy run and the more success we've had down here, like the second half of the year was a lot different than the first half of the year for me. And then playoffs have taken a whole another set. I actually think that a lot, a lot changed after All-Star game down here. I think that was great for... Um, the city, the town, like myself and Barky. And then through the run, it's gotten a little bit crazier. And then ever since playoffs, especially since the game seven win, it's been uh, it's been a lot different. Well, one here. of the delightful things that happens in community around a team like this that is being celebrated in that region, I remember this distinctly about the last time this happened down here, is all of a sudden you're walking in everywhere and you're getting standing ovations. You are uh, People are buying your meals. Is that something that's happening now down here, or have we not gotten there yet? <laughs> uh, we got a meal the other day, but uh, haven't. I really haven't been uh, – out too much during this i'm trying to trying to do everything i can to to keep that focus but uh, the other day for for me a few of us went out and we got it uh paid for so uh, i guess that's a you will never have off. to you will never have to pay for a rock and rib roll at the westchester flanagan's have you been to have you flanagan's gone yet? yet have you gone to flanagan's I've, yet i've been to the flanagan's by the rink but i haven't been yeah to it's that's always my, happy hour that's my Saw grass. Grass. yeah <laughs> chucky do you? I love the way you chew your mouthpiece. I've never seen it actually fully in your mouth. The way I see you when you're on the bench chewing that thing and it's dangling it's out of your disgusting. mouth. It's disgusting. I imagine you sleep with it at night. Do you? <laughs> I do not. I actually need a fresh one here soon. So no, don't change it. I'm, I'm all over. I go through a handful, more than a handful, do I guess. Do you ever you actually have it in your mouth the way it's supposed to be? Or do you just start the game with it dangling out of your mouth? I'm not gonna lie. At the at the beginning of every shift, I try to try to make sure that it's fully in, but within seconds, I'm sure I just don't think about it, and it's being chewed on. Don't change it. It's good luck. Don't can, change it. Can you explain to us, please, the level of pain threshold that is presently required at this level of play that you are playing at? Because hockey players are notoriously tough. Who's toughest right now, gritting through God knows what in your locker room? Yeah, uh, hockey players are are the toughest from the stuff I've seen. I don't, won't get into individual stuff or what people are playing through or have played through this season, but it's not just playoff hockey what guys play through. It's game ten of the year. You know, like uh, hockey players are tough. Um, 
And it's not just, you know, it's, it's up and down your lineup, your, your best players to, you know, your you know, goalies or guys that aren't even playing that want to be playing that have injury. Like it's just, it's just the culture and how it is. So um, this time of year, like you got to block that big shot. You got to get that puck out, even though, you know, you're going to get crushed. You got to go to the net hard. You got to stay there. You got to take a few cross checks. Just, it's just the way it is guys. So um, so it makes hockey so great. You remember that dorky guy with the glasses that uh, we brought uh, to that interview with you before the season, and he was just all like emo about Jonathan Huber, though. He has refused to capitulate. He won't give you your flowers. So just for me and my group chat, yeah, can you please. just say, screw you, witty? <laughs> uh, well, I'll just say because he's not on here. That's the only reason why I'm saying it. He's not on here. So screw you, witty, for not being on here. Yeah! yeah! I told him to come in and apologize to you face to face. He refused. He said, I got a thing. How dare he? He's stare, he's chicken. Stare to the camera. You, yeah. stare to the camera. you guys are embarrassing me. You are, what? You're, you're not journalists anymore. You're, Dan, you called him an asshole. You said I love you. Yeah, you Super did. compliment. You're, I asked him I what his name was. When I, he said, I what's you your name, that? buddy? <laughs> uh, thank you for being on with us, Matthew. Has your dad, does your dad concede that you're the better player? How does that one work? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You remember Keith. Like, let's. Uh, we got to, uh, we got to do a lot more uh, in my career before we can be in that conversation with him. But uh, hopefully we can start with a, uh, a long playoff run and play for multiple more weeks. I love you. Does he Thank you so much for making my life so much Seriously, better. Seriously, I just want to hug I, you. Just, can I just I hug wish, you right now? Can you just? It's uncomfortable. Just, just be here forever and yeah. just yes. d well, just keep playing the way that you're playing. They've I'm got him signed so forever. Isn't it like a million yeah. year contract? Uh, no uh, trade pause. You're like you've got to stay here. The greatest thing that ever happened to me, and I'm just so grateful for you. Well, thank you guys. Hopefully, you guys can watch uh, for a few more rounds. Of oh, I'll be too. there. Yeah. Oh, I'll I'll be there with a hat on. I don't know what that means. I Neither don't, do I. Just a hat. Only a hat. Just, a hat. Only a hat. Just a hat. <laughs> Only a hat. And if you score three, that's coming off too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Love you. I'm embarrassed. He's one of my favorite television writers, one of my favorite journalists, and he fights for the right things. David Simon created The Wire and has been very grateful to HBO over the years for giving him an opportunity again and again to make stuff that he cares about and he acknowledges maybe only he cares about, and then he tries <laughs> to make it so interesting that other people end up caring about it. He's on the front lines here of the writer's strike. He's a reasonable Hollywood person and writer, and I want to understand what's happening around him because he's a leader in this industry, and he's leading now, and they need to collectively bargain something. Last time you were on with us, uh, I, I think it was the last time, you said, I have long since stopped trusting billionaires to ever do the right thing. And right. now they're coming for content, and after 25 years working for a Hallmark HBO thing, you are no longer employed by HBO, correct? Well, I'm suspended. <laughs> um, they may, uh, th there's, I mean, I still uh, could end up back there. Uh, this is this is the result of the strike. And I'm not the only one. I mean, they've, a lot of development deals were suspended uh, by the various studios. And, and um, you know, you could so almost look at that as inevitable. We are in the middle of a job action. But yes, for the first time in 25 years, I'm not, I'm not on the, HBO payroll at present. So. Your your anger is a righteous one, generally. You fight for the right things, in my opinion. So w tell me what's happening here through your eyes. Well, this isn't the first horse that they've uh, shot out from under me or tried to shoot out from under me. I mean, I was a newspaperman, and I, I was there when Wall Street came for newspapers. And the premise is always the same. Um, and it's the, problem, it's the problem of sort of end-stage capitalism here, which is something we're going to have to deal with, is that... Um, when Wall Street decides money can be made, they're not particularly interested in whether or not the industry itself that they're looking at is going to be healthier or worse off or gone uh, in, in a year or two years or 10 years. What they're interested in is the quarterly profit. And if they can juke the quarterly profit number and get the CEOs to do that, the CEOs will get bonuses and, and the shareholders will get money. Uh, but in the end, uh, all the regional newspapers will be destroyed in the case of the, my earlier industry. And right now what they're doing is they're saying to, they've discovered uh, the possibilities of, um, of the entertainment industry. And what they've decided with, with television and film is, you know what, if we can 
make these numbers quarterly, if we can get to the places we want to be right now, uh, we'll pay those bonuses and we'll pay those investors. Um, but they're not really looking at what they're doing to the product. And, and the first place is one of the first places they've targeted is the writers um, because the writers are uh, um, a little bit off. The, we're, 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 the, we're the off camera talent. Um, we're not the thing that you see right away, but um, uh, they seem to think that um, things like AI uh, or smaller writer rooms or fewer writers uh, are going to produce better content. Same thing as they used to do with newspapers, which is, you know, uh, we can we can make more money putting out a weaker newspaper with less reporters and smaller news hole than we can putting out a better one. So let's put out a weaker one. But Dave, you're talking about end of time stuff here with the economy and whatnot. You're you're you've been shouting angrily at the heavens for a long time about do you realize what we're doing to freedom, to democracy, that money is contaminating and everything money has bought politics. You're right now screaming, of course I'm going to get trampled by this. I'm just a writer. Money's going to win. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm i in a strong union right now. The WGA is a union that fights. It has. We've gone out before. Uh, the last time we went out, it was because they were telling us, oh, this new thing, the Internet, that we may be platforming on, we're not sure there's any money in that. and We're not sure there's any profit or any future. Let's leave that alone and let's not deal with that in this in this negotiating cycle that was 2007 2008 and we and we walked and we got a piece of the internet um which is what writers have to do you know we're, we're, we're producing all this stuff and we, we we want just a share of the pie it's you know we're really fighting over about two percent of of the uh of the net profits of of this industry uh, that that's the, that's what the battle is going on where the riots are, writers are trying to secure that much so listen you know the only the only remedy for this kind of capitalism is collective bargaining. You know, I, I think I, I, if you're a worker anywhere on the planet, you should be in a union. And I think uh, WGA is evidence of that. And I'm happy to be in this fight with them. David, you mentioned other showrunners are having their deals suspended as well as part of this uh, strike action. How commonplace is that in these types of uh, Oh, I think it's strike? relatively common. Yeah. Yeah it's, really, yeah, it's really common. I, I you know, I tw what I tweeted out about it when was I got the notice. I got the my 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 guy got the call and said he's just, you know, he's suspended as of this date. And I happened to be walking the picket line at uh, at Silver Cup Studios in Queens. So I took a picture of the strikers in front of me, uh, you know, a little bit of a video. And I said, you know, after 25 years um, on this day, I happen to be doing the right W.R.I.T.E. Uh -huh. thing. Uh, and sent it out. Um, I think some people thought they had killed me, like they had basically just said, "You're dead to us forever." Um, no, they said, "We're not paying you while you're while you're walking the line." In my situation with development deals, it's for showrunners. It's kind of a delicate thing, which is some of what I do is writing, and it's covered by the contract, and some of what I do is producing, and that's not covered. That's managerial, and it's not covered by the contract. And there is a dispute as to what uh, people in development deal can and can't do without crossing the line. Um, and it's subtle. For example, you know, I don't change the script, but I get I, I go to cover set and I end up changing a line because the actor's having trouble with it. Or I'm in editing and I need to get down to time and I need to create a bridge scene because I got to cut two other scenes. And so now I'm writing a new page. Those are things I can't do. Now I'm engaged in writing. But the editing and the going to set mm -hmm. are theoretically, if I don't touch the script, so um, there's a dispute between the union and, and, and showrunners are sort of in the middle and trying to gauge this. And, and most of us, I think, are trying to be honorable and, and correct to the union. And, you know, for my purposes, I won't go to set because I think once I go to set, I'm going to be messing with the script. So, you know, as a showrunner, I can't do that if I happen to be in production when a strike happens. Why didn't this, hap hap why didn't this happen back in 07? Because uh, they were trying to say that um, there was no money in the Internet. And they should be able to stream and there should be no residuals there. And we shouldn't have any piece of whatever. We should just stick to broadcast. And you can see the, 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 the incredible dishonesty of that, the negotiating dishonesty. Now what they're saying is the exact same thing when it comes to AI. Hey, listen, we don't know if AI is going to be able to write scripts or not. We don't know if there's any money in that. We don't know if it'll be a help to writers or if it'll replace or where. We don't know anything about it. We're just, you know, we're just ass ignorant and we are the networks and just trust us for another three years and we'll come back and we'll talk about this. That's their, that's their negotiating position right now. And our position is, no, AI is here. We need to address whether or not you seriously think this is going to uh, 
replace creative writers. Your tone, uh, I'm used to you, acid and righteous anger. And you are being, you're being, you're, you're being in tone uh, very reasonable as a collective. You're trying to get me mad. <laughs> you're, you're, you're provoking me. I, uh, I hope to. I thought that that was a natural condition that you were perpetually in. I thought the country. You can't get there I, this I, time, I, 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 You know how hard it is to make you smile? It's really hard to make you smile. But as a collective bargainer. Yeah, I'm out of work. I'm out of work. <laughs> You're more relaxed. Um, I want to understand the business parts of this, like how each side approaches it, the strategies involved, when do you and how do you make the other side understand what your priorities are? How do you hide the bottom lines from each other? I'm, I'm curious about the business it's a game mechanics. Of chicken. It's, uh, every strike is a game of chicken. Who can last? Um, and and it, look, it's not about me. Uh, you know, I don't live paycheck to paycheck. I've been, you know, I've been on the HBO for 25 years as a, as a producer, so I'm fine. Um, but but workaday writers and support staff and, and other industries that rely on 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 the um, the stream of pages to sets, um, you know, for them it's hard, uh, and so that that's on our side of the ledger. On their side of the ledger, they're going to run out of content, and um, subscribers want content. There's a certain amount that's still in the pipeline, and they can wait that out and and, and get that on screen. Um, but they're, you know, beyond that, they need to continue to develop or they're, or they're going to go stale. These streaming services and these networks are going to go stale. So, um, it's a game of chicken. And the only thing I think that is to their disadvantage, honestly, is, um, is how angry writers are. Uh, a, you know, a few years ago, a third of all writers were working at the minimum level, the minimum scale. Now it's half. Writers are actually earning less than we were a decade ago. Uh, and the reason is shorter, shorter seasons. Everything's not 22 episodes anymore. Now it's eight or 10, although they take longer to make. They have more production value. The writing is more complex. You're writing without commercials. So it's 58 minutes, not 43. Um, so these hours take longer, but we're paid by the episode, many of us. And that means we're making less for doing as much work. Um, also, they've decided that uh, because a lot of these shows are, um, the stories are not, truly episodic they're all connected as one story hey why don't you write all of them? why don't you get in a, in a mini room a small pre-production room 10 weeks just beat the hell out of it get give us eight scripts and then we don't need to keep the writers around well, that's you know obviously you don't do as you don't do that kind of work when you're when you're when you're shoveling it that fast that, but, that's that's but a torture. Thing. What you've just described is a torture chamber for writers. Throw them it's, into throw them into a cauldron. Make them work twenty hour well, days. You know then, what makes great writing? You know what makes great writing? Rewriting. You know, and they're not leaving time for that. And then once you get to set, they're all you know. Hey, we lost this location. This actor is struggling with this storyline. Uh, this actor um, uh, it can't be there for this scene because they just had a, their, their wife just had a baby. You know, nothing nothing is nothing goes as you planned it. So just because you have a script in hand doesn't mean that you don't need writers on set or later in editing to write additional dialogue for looping. You need writers throughout the process. That's what makes it good. Um, and, and their attitude is, no, 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 no. It's, you know, the one showrunner or maybe one guy can do that for 10, 12 episodes. Let everybody go after the mini room. Well, not only does it making for a worse product, but here's what it's doing to the writer's life. You it, now need to, it's you need, need to work. You're, it's you're, you're working eight weeks. You're working 10 weeks. And then you're off for the rest of the year. But it's crazy that it would be week? this corporate. It's crazy to me that they would be trying to put a value on the idea of, well, anything and anyone can be equally creative. It, we don't need hey. writers. We don't need what we'll just do it with artificial intelligence and we'll fool the audience. It's really insulting. I mean, well, listen, you can fool some of the people all the time. Uh, it, it wasn't like 30, 40 years ago before the quote, uh, the golden age of television. When there, there were so many derivative cop shows, so many derivative, you know, medical shows, you know, whatever it was, you know, it was, you could watch Mannix, you could watch Ben Casey. It didn't matter. There was a lot of crap on TV. There always will be. Hmm. Uh, and maybe we're reaching the point where AI can write that. But, but what AI is, is basically you grift, you grift this. You, 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 it's basically mass plagiarism. You take every single cop show ever written and you throw it into a computer and you create an algorithm that, that, that chews that up and, and, and delivers a completely derivative cop show back to the audience. And some people, um, you know, while they're doing the laundry or, you know, or playing cards and not really thinking about what's on TV, they'll be happy with that. And you'll get some viewership.
but if you want to keep doing if you want television to continue to be a grown-up medium as it's suddenly become um you can't do that it's just derivative david we've got less than a minute left jessica what do you have for david simon we had a writer on last week, Alex O'Keefe, who's a television writer, and I was dismayed to see a lot of the comments on our Instagram post were along the lines of, like, why should we feel bad for him? He, you know, we're all struggling, too. Why should we feel bad for these Hollywood types? My question is, like, why is there so little working class solidarity among people who, like you said, could all really benefit from a union in this country? Look, union membership in this country is down to 6%, and wages and, and, and family earnings are declining. What made the middle class in the 20th century was the fact that America got unionized. Uh, collective bargaining is the only plausible way um, to get your fair share. And that's true. That's true no matter what you do. If you're a school teacher, cop, firefighter, you know, uh, uh, grip, director, uh, writer, it doesn't matter. Um, the walking the line, on my picket line, I'm walking the line with Teamsters, I'm walking the line with, with IATSE, you know, with the crew. I'm walking the line with uh, DGA and some SAG members. Everybody realizes that this cycle, where, like union has been made vulnerable. These people have broken a system where, you know, we were all in, modestly advancing in our careers and modestly advancing in our, in our, in our, in our, um, in our earning power. Um, and we've taken a huge step back in the last, last two cycles. And so that's not just my union. That's, that's the working class unions. That's the guys driving the trucks and, and, and setting up the rigging. And they're walking the line with us in support. So that's what I'd say to them. David, always an admirer. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Thank you for listening. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Yeah. Seems uh, like there's an opening for me, Dan, huh? <laughs> <laughs> We're living in a pretty cool time in basketball. And this, Stugatz, in the sport that is soap opera, narratives, personality, sells its stars very well. This right now, we're in the middle of, like, historic things. LeBron at his age. Does the Warriors dynasty go, uh, you know, go down in flames here at the end to LeBron and Anthony Davis as his story changes? And now DeMarcus Cousins is saying best two-way defender ever. LeBron saying Anthony Davis is the best defender in the league. Everyone in the league knows that. Well, I didn't know that. But you're saying it to me now as his teammate. He's your fountain of youth. This whole thing works with the Lakers, not a bubble aberration. It works if Anthony Davis can be the bigger, better extraterrestrial against Embiid and Jokic. The, the Embiid story, the play you remember, the visual you remember on that giant hulking specimen of an MVP is crying when Kawhi broke his heart. Crying. The play of his career. This guy cares. This guy cares about being excellent at basketball, and he's up against dudes. Jokic just went with a stat line. Jokic just went with a stat line, Stugatz. Averaged a triple-double. Never happened before in two games. Lost both of them. Right. Because he's playing against Durant, who's mismanaged the entirety of his career, and he might go down in flames now because his bench stinks in Phoenix. A lot of legacy stuff is happening. I mean, what's true and what's real on Anthony Davis? Because the praise will come for him if he slays all of these guys, and it'll stop being about whether he, his body was broken and he's always, what, is it, what does Charles call him, street clothes? Like if he wins another championship over these particular players, he will have bailed out LeBron at the end. Well, yeah. I mean, if he plays like he did the last couple of games against Golden State, before that, remember, the story of him so far in the playoffs is on again, off again. Great game, disappear. Great game, disappear. Throughout these very playoffs. And games three and four were the first back-to-back -back great games he put together. And really game four, we look at it as a great game more for his impact on the defense. My, my point is but this if is he stays a, healthy, I mean, I'm sorry, Dan. If he stays healthy, Anthony Davis, he's going to string together my, great my games. My point is I mean, your, your opinion is going to change right now game by game. And what I'm telling you is they're fighting for their legacies. And B doesn't want to be the guy who is really great. Look, Giannis is on. Giannis is telling everybody, I'm tired of being disrespected. I'm coming. Well, you, then don't lose to an eight seed. Yeah, I, I like. I'm well coming. Said. I'm right. coming when October. <laughs> Dude, shut up, but, man. Go away. But, like, but I'm just saying, like he's a toenail from us still laughing at him. Yeah. No, that's and that's the I've talked about this many a time. I love those old NBA on NBC intros, and one of my favorite ones talks about, oh, you know. Uh, Ernie Banks, Mr. Sh Mr. Cub, never went to the World Series. And Bob Lanier, never played in the NBA Finals. And Michael Jordan, what has this bum ever done? 
And it's it's ama an amazing kind of window into a time that now I don't think anyone re remembers, even believes existed, where people were questioning, how good is Michael Jordan? What has he ever done? The Stugats of the day. But we're writing that now in a, a more divisive culture yes. and a more divisive media age. Like, these yep. guys are, when Giannis is complaining about this isn't failure, one guy gets to win, one woman gets to win, and everyone else loses. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is a loser. And there, there are three players here who are a problem in the postseason size-wise for Bam. And Bam's pretty good, and Mike's trading him every two days. <laughs> I've traded him every season for the last three. You understand you. what I'm saying? Bam, who's unlike most people you've ever seen play basketball, mm -hmm. is dwarfed by Anthony Davis, Jokic, and Joel Embiid. Yeah, and, and, the, and Giannis, by the way. He's dwarfed by Giannis as well. And the irony is, as much as Mike wants to trade Bam, Bam does a good job against those guys. Like, especially considering his size. And that's what makes it so difficult, whether you give up on him or not. But the reality is then, yes, we are in a more divisive time. Yes, we are doing this day by day. But that's the story of our league. That's what we do. We build people up and we d destroy them. Mike sat here for years saying, Steph Curry, what has he ever done? As he's winning championships. Then last year he does it, and Mike says, okay, you got me. And now – they're down three one. Mike's back to like saying, "Ah, eh, what have you ever done?" So I don't think Mike's doing that though. Like I think he also but he people, continued yeah. validating it with Game Seven yeah, in and Sacramento. Before I said he's right. done plenty, best shooter I've ever seen. I just need him to see the. I need to see him be the best in the NBA Finals, and he did that. I've got no no strikes against you, Steph Curry. All right, so you're Mike, allowed. Mike, it's Clay Mike, Thompson. Mike That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's always somebody, but uh, but the Warriors might be done. I mean, like they all of it, tonight. all of it. I mean, they were done two years ago, right? And then they came back and they did it again. Oh, but Clay's not going to get better at this. Clay, this is. But a, they have Pool, <laughs> the perfect replacement. <laughs> I mean, Clay, Clay's body is breaking down, and he's aging the way athletes age, and you're seeing it in the postseason. We talked about him, the best two-way player. That yeah. was years ago. It's what not I, anymore. What I'm noticing in this run is some of these players are getting old. Like you just re referenced Anthony Davis as a fountain of youth, and you've been doing though. He's north thirty. Yep. You know, I mean, Kevin league. Durant is now at a stage in his career and they ruined their team with that trade in terms of the, in the depth. League. He played 42 minutes. Look at those shooting stats last night. No legs under him. Mm -hmm. Was happy to hear you say he mismanaged his career. Welcome to the party, Dan. I saw the headlines here yesterday. A lot of ex-Bills punter Matt Ariza breaks silence after officials say he wasn't present during alleged rape. I see a lot of headlines and a lot of people jumping to conclusions about the idea of him being wrongly accused and losing a year of his career as a punter. He's the punt god. It's 80-yard punts and didn't play for Buffalo uh, last year after being drafted because they fired him. And a lot of people are yelling about innocent until proven guilty. And a lot of people are having uh, this story is being turned into something. And I don't know what the truth is. And I don't have a 200 page transcript in front of, of in front of me the way uh, Diana Moskovitz does. She's the investigations editor at Defector. She's working on something special and nebulous. I can't tell you about for Metal Arc Media. And there's a lot in those 200 pages, and I'm reading some of the details, Diana, and thank you for joining us. I don't know how to talk about this story, so I'll tell the audience that you're, in, in, in being an investigations editor, you're interested in the facts, correct? Like, there's a form of advocacy journalism here, but you're also interested in the facts in those 200 pages, what's true and what's not. Yes. So um, first, some quick catch up for folks who might be wondering, how did we get to this point? Right. So Matt Ariza, great punting prospect, dropped in the sixth round, notable because punters and kickers sometimes aren't drafted at all. Then civil lawsuit was filed by a young woman. She said she was gang raped by three San Diego State football players at a Halloween party in 2021. And at the time, she was 17 years old. And the players she named included Ariza. Pretty soon after that lawsuit was filed, the bills cut him um, and his lawyer has since said and come out that they are going to clear their client's name. Um, as after the civil lawsuit was announced, San Diego authorities, police and prosecutors said, yes, we're investigating uh, late December or maybe mid-December of last year. Uh, law enforcement prosecutors announced they would not bring criminal charges. So we've always we've known since December that he was not going to be criminally charged. Um, civil lawsuit ongoing. 
And so then what's led up to these headlines is the recent development, the uh, coming public of a transcript or in some cases audio recording of a meeting that prosecutors had with the woman um, in which they talked about their decision to not bring criminal charges. Um, and in that conversation, uh, the lead prosecutor assigned to the case essentially said that they believe the young woman had sex with Ariza, but they could not prove that it wasn't consensual, that the evidence they had gathered pointed toward consent. There is a murkier incident that happens later on that evening in a bedroom. Um, that is what led to some of the headlines when the lawsuit was filed saying that there was a possible gang rape. But when prosecutors spoke with the young woman, they said that from what they had gathered, it appeared that Ariza had left the party by then. So that is what this document revealed. And this is what has generated a lot of headlines. Um, understandably, Ariza's attorneys have seen this and are saying you know, this is proof of his innocence, that he shouldn't have been included, that they, um, so forth and so forth. Um, the young woman's legal team will point to what is also true, which is that this is one piece of evidence among many, many, many that have been gathered um, in this case. And so they are also, again, moving forward with their civil case and say that there are, you know, other pieces of the puzzle that we don't see yet, um, which is also true. But, Diana, what happened yesterday? Because it seemed like that was sent out into the atmosphere uh, to, in, in what has become in America and around the world, something that sometimes feels like a war between men and women and female rights. Uh, this was tossed into the atmosphere yesterday, and it's complicated subject matter because of some of the details in the hopes that people wouldn't look any further, and this bit of evidence would be enough to make someone who could already feel very much like a victim more like a victim because that seemed like an agenda that was thrown into the into the air yesterday with these headlines, correct? If you're saying it's, I don't know what happened here, but it seems like there was something that, there was an agenda behind what happened in the leaking of this information. Am I wrong? You know, there's always, uh, as, as journalists, sometimes we don't necessarily talk about this, the politics and the strategy of the leaking, right? You can look at this document and clearly see um, whom it favors and, and look at it coming out now, right? And think, gee, um, I wonder how this is getting out into the public sphere, right? And, and this is just part of journalism. I think that, you know, it was part of like a, a I don't know that I would call it part of a broader conspiracy so much as this is unfortunately in some ways part of our criminal process which is not just the actual or i shouldn't say criminal process excuse me because this is civil right now um this is civil not criminal very important for everyone to know um much lower bar than in a criminal proceeding okay um that not only do you have this march toward a trial but you have people leaking things to the press and giving out quotes and you have two sides and both sides are trying to paint the best portrait of their side and i think with our justice system we get wrapped up in these ideas of like the truth and, and justice and definitively knowing what happened and that's not necessarily how it actually works for either party or any party right? You're, you're just trying to persuade a judge or a jury. You're trying to make a case, right? Um, and so this is unfortunately sometimes part of that process. Um, and so that's how I see it as a journalist who has handled leaps before. Is, but, but, yeah, but they Diana, happen. Forgive me. Is this not just out of the textbook, though, of shame the promiscuity of someone who might be a victim? Like, is this not just... 101 dirty law on exactly what you have to do, whether it's true or not. And I don't know what's true here. For me, who's someone who's written about cases like this now going back two decades, I always want to caution this with, I've seen this so much that 
I feel like there's this expectation that I'm supposed to have this big fiery answer. Like, am I not outraged? Am I not a feminist? Like, am I not insulted? And, and but I see this so often, right? Like at some point, how much more anger can I give people versus saying, this is the process. And when we ask, why don't people report when they believe they have been sexually assaulted? Well, here's why, because would you want to go through this? Because this is what happens. And there's only so much we can do with um, certain statutes blocking the admission of certain things into evidence in a courtroom. But if you come forward and say, I have been sexually assaulted or just a victim of any sort of sexual misconduct, like, this is what will happen to you. This is the defense. And even if certain things are blocked from being admitted in court, someone can leak things to the press. And um, it just takes one certain style of headline to, boom, light it up on fire and feed everyone who wants to see you know, and, and say, oh my gosh, this man's life was ruined, um, to which I want to remind everyone he is very young, he is 22 years old, and it is still distinctly possible that Matt Ariza is on a team this coming season, right? A little early to say life destroyed. He's 22. He could still be signed with a team. Trial is set for this October. Life is not over yet. Um, and we still don't know what the result of that trial will be, right? And anyone who sat through trial can tell you it's a fool's errand trying to guess what will happen, you know. Um, good luck trying to guess what a judge will do, and even better luck trying to guess what a jury will do. Um, so it this is part of it. This is a huge part of it. And it, this would happen in just about any case, unfortunately. And so it's I I understood. I, excuse me while I stumble over my words a little bit, but um, it, you. Both things can be true. It could be outrageous and horrifying. And also, this is extremely common. This happens in these cases extremely frequently. And the only thing that changes is are do reporters pick up on it? How do they report on it? You know, how do they frame it? Um, I would be remiss if I did not point out that uh, the recording and or transcript of this meeting um, was actually first reported by San Diego media, media back in like middle of April, uh, but did not catch wildfire, right? Because they reported on it in a very different manner, in a different tone and with a different headline. Um, headlines do make a difference. Um, and it was this most recent report by Yahoo that really caught everyone's attention. But this had been out there for a while. What was the tone of the San Diego reports? Uh, I would say, and I... I I would imagine people might disagree with me. You know, in my opinion, I thought that the San Diego reports were, a, they were more even handed, you know, um, they were talking about this show, the complexity of the case, this shows the complexity of investigating reports of sexual assault. Um, they focused less on just what this meant for Matt Ariza because they're local media. So they're looking at this as a, uh, as a local story and not just an NFL story. Um, and I think it's interesting how that framing them taking a different viewpoint, a different tone. Um, I have to admit, I missed those when they first came out. And then when the Yahoo story came out, I started trying to backtrack, figure out what happened here and realized, oh, this has been out. Um, there was at least one TV station in San Diego that reported on it. San Diego Union Tribune also reported on it since like probably about April 21st, you know, um, it just didn't pick up. And then, it was the Yahoo story that really got people talking. Diana, you mentioned the civil suit is moving forward. How, when Arise has been proven that he his absence at the scene of the crime, pretty much, how, what strategy is the suit going to take in order to continue to implicate him? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I, again, this is where I, this whole thing blew up and I understand why and if you're Matt Ariza and his defense team which reminder we all have the right to a defense counsel something we should not hold against Matt Ariza we all want that he's invoking his right we all want that um but naturally of course his, his defense counsel is pointing at this and going like look 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 like prosecutors said they can't put him there you know they can't put him there um but to the rest of that I can't say much because again, this is just one piece of evidence and I, I just, uh, this is where I,
evidence. I'm not one of the attorneys. I don't have evidence to like the giant box, you know, that everyone has gotten. And so this is where um, I know it can feel strange to sometimes just want to tell people like everyone, let's just take a beat. Let's just take a breath <laughs> because we haven't seen everything. We've seen one thing. We've seen one piece of evidence. Um, so beyond that, like, People just see what they want to see. And I think that's what you see online is we've got one piece of evidence. And I've seen this happen in cases before where they become like a Rorschach test, where in this one document, you can see so much. Um, and I think that's what people are doing right now, especially people who want to believe that Matt Ariza will be completely cleared of everything. You know, so they see this as the Holy Grail and um Perhaps it will play out that way, but there's so much we don't know. And so I could guess as to what the strategy would be, but I don't feel great doing that. And we, we don't, and as someone who has guessed in the past and been wildly wrong, like you just don't know until trial happens in October. You know, we don't know. There's still motions now discussing potential evidence, you know, and what will be admitted and how, and how frankly it will be shared with reporters um, because there's videos as well. So there's just, there's so much going on. And so to just say like, this is what's going to happen. This is what the strategy will be, you know, um, I'm beyond saying it looks like Matarize's legal team is going to argue he wasn't there. And if prosecutors can't put him there, then how could anyone put him there? The rest of it, you know, we're just, we're just, we're just guessing until the trial happens. And I know that's not a very fulfilling answer, but no one knows until it starts. No one knows. Everything's just conjecture, you know. Diana, thank you. It's why it's diff It's one of the reasons it's difficult to talk about, and it's probably one of the reasons that we could keep collecting facts before arriving at whatever your opinion is. I don't know what those 200 pages in that document prove. Uh, I don't know what is proven in there. Uh, we will f find out going forward if we stay on this story. Thank you, Diana. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Our next guest, you know him, you love him from Inside the NBA, that show that's won every single Emmy it's ever been nominated for, ever, ever in the history of everything. He's also <laughs> a two-time champion with the Houston Rockets. He won a national championship at North Carolina. And he's got a new book, Talk of Champions, Story of the People Who Made Me, a memoir. The rare book, Stugatsa, has two colons in the title. Hmm. I like it. Yeah. Can Kenny, I got to ask you, uh, there's a famous clip they always show of you on Inside the NBA. You, I believe, as a kid, maybe seventh, eighth grade, when you played at Madison Square Garden, and the mm. caption calls you Ken Smith. Is that the first yes. time in history we've ever had a child named Ken who grew up to be a man named Kenny? <laughs> <laughs> you know what the funny part of that is? You know, you know, back, you know, in the in that that era, you would never call Ken. Kenny, you would all, or Kenneth. It was always, it, I mean, Kenny, it was always Ken or Kenneth. No one called me Kenny a lot, a lot of times. And then right around, the, right in the mid 80s, it became Kenny. And, uh, <laughs> but the funny thing is last night, you know, because they, everyone knows I'm a New Yorker. No, I, you know, at the, at the core, I'm still a Knicks fan. They were like, we're going to call you Ken and we're not giving you your NY back unless the Knicks win. <laughs> You're not getting it back, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> not till next I'm year. I'm going to be Ken for the rest of my life. <laughs> Wait, so Let's Ken, go, New York. <laughs> I mean, Kenny, I'm a Knicks fan, and I've been waiting forever, like most Knicks fans, for them to be relevant and good again. But there's no way you think this team or thought this team was good enough to advance past the second round, did you? Well, no, I mean, I think once, however, once Miami won, I think that there was there was a, a a collective thought in the city that they could, uh, not if Milwaukee had advanced. But you know, I honestly, which was crazy, I I picked Miami, which was like blasphemous. I got calls from all the regulars, from Stephen A. and Spike, <laughs> like saying I was blasphemous for picking Miami. I just thought they were a better team overall, maybe not individually in certain spots, but I thought they collectively were playing better. Kenny. You said on Undisputed that you think Michael Jordan would have struggled in the social media era. Uh, obviously, you and MJ go all the way back to North Carolina. Why do you say that? 
In terms, I think it was a little bit out of context in terms of struggle. I meant, like, his popularity would have been too much. Like, the guy was the most recognizable face, him and Michael Jackson, like, in the world. And you can imagine if social media, when you can have that instantaneous oatmeal mm. and, like, get everything for him. Because, and everyone's like, well, social media. We had social media. It was just called a newspaper. It was archaic. <laughs> but it was just, but everybody, he was in every newspaper and every sports channel. So to get him instantaneous and to also see what he does on his normal life, walking around, people filming him in hotel lot, like his popularity would have been too much. And I, I, it would have been something that I don't even think he would have wanted. You don't think it would have been like he accidentally posted a selfie on Twitter and everyone was like, oh, like you're such a boomer, like that kind of thing, struggle? <laughs> no, I, no, because, you know, the one thing about Michael that separates him from LeBron is, like, to me, he's the first of his kind. Like, what Michael was doing, the reason it was so intriguing as well as, you know, he was winning, was that we had never seen him win that way and his ar acrobatics and the way he played the game. Where LeBron, when he's at his best, he's taking the best of the best player in the world. So he's taking the best of Magic. He's taking the best of Jordan. The best. So we've seen it. But with Michael, we had never really seen it. Dr. J was close, but not what Michael was doing. Like, we just had never seen that before. And that, with social media, oh, my God. It, oh my, yeah, it, too much, man. But, Kenny, there are two things that separate LeBron and Michael. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> Two rings. Uh -oh. You know that. <laughs> you know, and, and but hey, the guy's still playing, so we can't say two rings. We might not be saying two rings for long because he's still playing, and you know, in year twenty, he still looks like he's in year ten. So who knows how long this guy's gonna play? Uh, but you know, I, I just think that you know, when we talk about the comparisons, it always talks about the gravity of an era you lived in because. I'm old enough to be in both. So I understand what that shot against Elo really meant, other than it was a great shot. It was like he, uh, Cleveland Cavaliers were about to possibly win some NBA titles with that team. Mm. And he, he, made, he made them dismantle it. So, like, I understand the gravity, just the way I understand the gravity of what LeBron when he beat the Pistons. Like, so I, if I compare gravity, I always take Jordan. We're talking to Kenny Smith. He's a co-host on... Turner Sports inside the NBA. They have the exclusive rights to the Eastern Conference uh, Finals. And, of course, he's the author of the new book, Talk of Champions, Story of the People Who Made Me a Memoir. Stugatz, this is the question I got for Kenny because he played with Michael Jordan in North Carolina and they won a championship there. But he played with Hakeem Olajuwon mm -hmm. in the, with the Rockets in the NBA and they won two championships there. The two years Michael was out. Yeah. And Stugatz, you always say that if Michael had never retired, what would have happened? Kenny Smith would not have two rings, nor would Elijah Wan or Tom Janovich or anyone on that team. I mean, why you put me on the spot? But, Kenny, that's the truth, right? I, I think you're 100% wrong. What? Yes, uh, there you go. 100%. Let him know. We, 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 we would have won. I mean, and I'm going to explain it to you. So you have a different, a different record, because everyone has a different reference of how this happened. First of all, do you really believe that the Michael Jordan would have won eight championships? Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yeah. However, did you watch the documentary? Uh, yes, uh, 17 times. Okay. <laughs> so there would have, there, there would, first of all, he was back when we won. He was wearing number 45, and when he got 55 at the Garden, nobody was saying he was rusty. Yeah. The reason <laughs> double nickel. The reason that the reason they lost to the, the, the to the Orlando Magic because there was no Horace Grant. They were small. They were a small team then without Horace Grant. So he was in Orlando. The reason Orlando beats them is because they're small and they have Shaq and then they have Horace Grant. They out-rebounded them. They're pounding them inside. We would have done the same exact thing. We swept the Orlando Magic, the team they lost to. We swept them. So that's the first part. The second part, there was no Rodman yet. Rodman comes two years later. So then Rodman comes, and now they got the rebounder. Now, if you ask me, can we beat the Orlando, I mean, the uh, Bulls with, with, with uh, Horace Grant or the Bulls with Rodman, I'd just scratch my head, and that would be a different possible answer. But that small team, as we've seen in the documentary, that was breaking up, oh, we're smacking them. <laughs> we, no, but Michael Jordan was still the greatest player in the world, but he just would, wouldn't have had the greatest team at that time.
What's the most misunderstood thing about Michael Jordan, you think? Well, I, I, I'm, when I, even in the book, I'm referencing a 19, 20, 21 year old mm-hmm. Michael that I knew from college. The guy that, you know, when you're on the road as a freshman, they put you with the upperclassmen and they say, you got a room with this guy on the road. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm referencing all of those, the vulnerability of what his dreams and aspirations were when you're sitting up and talking at night at two or three in the morning, like what you're going to do with your life when you grow up. So like, those are different references. I think so, you know, what I always noticed about him is he's the one guy who always could back up his thoughts. Like I'm going to, he could back it up. And because I thought he was the perfect size as a basketball player and what he doesn't get credit for as being the most fundamentally sound basketball player that that possibly have ever lived, he gets credit for his acrobatics. But if you look at the, the tapes, he's in the correct hand in the passing lane. He's um, his footwork is impeccable with it on the jab step in the post. He understands where the dynamics are, where the double teams are coming. That's what made him great to me. They were, the guys who were athletic as him, they usually didn't do that. And that separated him from all the other great athletes that played in that era. Kenny, what do you make of Jimmy Butler and really the transformation later in his career where I don't know if there's a historical comparison where a guy kind of bounced around the league was kind of a, you know, locker room cancer, uh, according Mm. to many people inside the NBA. He was, I mean. Mm. Um, And now you have a guy that's being talked about in the same sentence as LeBron and Kobe in terms of postseason assassin, postseason killers. Um, What do you make of what's happened to Jimmy Butler, his game, and the transformation uh, later in his career? Are you talking about Michael Jordan's son? No, I saw the memes too. I saw the memes. I saw the memes. You know, you know I, I think that, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy is like, it, it's kind of like the, the yelling coach. When they're winning, people go, oh, that's in great intensity. The guy fires everyone up. But when they're losing, oh, the team is tuning him out. He's a cancer. To, that's Jimmy Butler. He's the yelling coach. So, like, his style of play is either when it when you're winning, it's going to get praised, but when you're losing, could be viewed as disruptive. So he just found a group of guys that embraces the lack of disruption. We're talking to Kenny Smith. He's the author of Talk of Champions, Stories of the People Who Made Me, a memoir. Kenny, what's something, you know, every, every time someone writes a book, there's always stuff that gets left on the editing room floor because of <laughs> space and time, or whatever. But what's the best story that didn't make the book? Ooh, I, well, you know, I think I got a lot of it in because because what, what I was really wanting to do when I realized I was like, I just want people to feel good about themselves when they read the book and go, Man, when I'm successful, oh, that's why, because that's what Michael does. Michael Jordan, that's what Bill Russell does. That's what Shaq does. And I'm talking about from a political standpoint, from a social standpoint, and from a sports standpoint. Those are the characteristics that I have. Oh, I have a friend that I wrote, you know, that wrote in there, David Kohler, who was the head, you know, head of the Kohler family, the plumbing. The guy was sleeping on my couch in summer school, and he's worth $7 billion. But those conversations, I'm like, I always thought that there was more to it. You know, a guy Osiri who, you know, manages Sting, Madonna, one of the biggest names in entertainment. You know, this guy, you know, slept on my couch for 45 days. He was like, so like those stories that I took for granted. And you know what other guys, I took for granted that everyone had access to Bill Russell's and people like that. I took for granted Dean Smith's. And when I started writing in a book, I was like, man, you can't take this for granted. And I said, I said, I was sending in chapters to the editor and he was like, bro, you know, everybody writing chapters about have books about their life. I was like, man, it's, it's, it's that I had access and have access every day to these type of people. I thought if I knew this at 20, man, how, where my life even would be different now. The book is talk of champion stories of the people who made me a memoir. His name is Ken Smith. Because the Knicks ain't winning until next year. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yo, there's no NY in my name, baby. Come on, man. <laughs> I think the internet 
largely in consensus, even though uh, we're divided about everything, laughed in unison at the New York Times trying to rehabilitate Elizabeth Holmes. That <coughs> just what happened? Five dollars. Okay. Five dollars. You coughed into the microphone. I coughed this way. Your contradiction. No. Charles, uh, uh, roll the tape. Roll the tape. I, you, I, I, I literally I, leaned right, away. Go sit in the penalty no, box. No, 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 no. I'm not going to take five, this five because dollars. I want to talk about this. <laughs> five dollars and penalty box, no, please. No, no. I'll, I'll pay the five dollars, but I, I won't go to the penalty because I do want to talk about wait, this. You, you, you can come mm. back in two minutes, oh. and we may or may not be done with then it. You're it's not a getting these five dollars. What do you mean we're not getting the five dollars? Right, you I cough mean, right into the microphone, I man. Away. I, no. Protest. I am protesting this. It I started in the microphone and not. ended away from the I microphone. I choked. I leave. You know what? Get me a cough button. Get me a cough he button. He doesn't have a cough button, what and that's, that's on Ooh. us. Are we the court of appeals right now? Hmm. doesn't have a cough button. He didn't turn away enough, though. Oh, I'm sorry that we have such beautiful new microphones that pick up everything omnidirectional. But they're also mic arms that you could just put it away. Like, I did. I went. Like, <laughs> no, Roll the tape. Roll the tape. I, I promise. I'm, I'm kind of with a mean on this one. There you go. I got um, two on my side kinda. there. Uh, the penalty Same box, exact microphone. The penalty box is not a jury of your peers. The penalty box is the penalty box. And Unlike you can... the jury that convicted Elizabeth Holmes of fraud. <laughs> hey. uh, the, the New York Times, uh, <laughs> this was offensive. Like, how are we rehabbing already? That she, just got conv- she just got convicted of being a giant, giant fraud. Unlike, I mean, she was taking blood samples and just created a ty- an entirely fake business around it. And also creating, to my delight, the fake, limited fake Elizabeth Holmes, which Jessica, uh, I don't know where it is or how it is that you created it, but it's just talking in a deeper voice and fooling everybody. And it's now retired because she admitted in this New York Times profile that she was doing a voice, which is what everyone thought all along. Um, The thing about Elizabeth Holmes is that if she had just defrauded Henry Kissinger out of millions of dollars and not risked public health with that money, She'd be a hero. Yeah. I yeah. think we'd all be applauding her. Fair yeah. play to Elizabeth Holmes if you're just going to defraud Henry Kissinger <laughs> at his, uh, in his 99th year of all of his money. But she didn't. She endangered lives. Uh, she, she was not very good to her employees. There is a whole lot of really, really devastating details about what the cost of her Theranos experiment and these Edison machines was on people that worked at Theranos on it and at people who used these blood tests and got negative or positive like miscarriage or cancer results or whatever they were using it for. And so this New York Times profile like landed on with, with a thud on Sunday. And it, I wouldn't say that it necessarily like made her look good. But it definitely didn't mention any of the things that I just mentioned in any sort of serious way. And so it is being absolutely destroyed now. I, I've seen TikToks about it. I've seen tweets about it. it. It's just like a failure in expressing the gravity of what 14 years of fraud can actually do and the effect it has on people. D- do the voice. I, I, do the voice. I feel like the, the voice, it, it was it's a moment okay. in time. It's, o- it's over now. Do, do yeah, it's okay. Just we want to hear the voice. voice. Just the it, voice. It, it, she wants Fine. to retire because you put pressure on the voice. It's totally different than if it's just the do voice it. appearing do organically. It. It's a pressure she doesn't need. The voice is retired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's just not there anymore. <laughs> it's just not there it. anymore. I, it's not as good as I remembered. Because <laughs> it's This dead. is why she didn't want to do it's it. It's sad and it's gone. How is it that we're in a place, honestly, I ask this question sincerely, Santos is now going to jail uh, or going to prison allegedly or arrested? It appears he did his lips. We're, <laughs> we're, we're just, we're ev- fraud is okay or it's more okay than it's ever been. It's never been better to be a fraud. Uh-huh, that, this is well, my time. I would say, like, I've, I don't know what will happen with the George Santos charges, but, like, Elizabeth Holmes – she will probably have to serve a very lengthy sentence. I believe she's 39 years old right now, and if she serves the full 11-year sentence, she will not get out of jail until she's in her 50s. So she, she didn't really get away with it, I would say, but she did get away with it for a long time and probably longer than any sort of like government regulatory agency should have allowed her to or anyone, you know, like the, – the reporting on it came out, and John Kerry, who wrote the book Bad Blood, which is a really, really good book, did such a good job thoroughly investigating something that apparently had just 
flown over people's heads. There was a whistleblower that came forward. There were all sorts of people that were like, something's amiss here. And it wasn't until his reporting, really, that people were like, oh, this is all smoke and mirrors. Like, what the hell? I mean, welcome back. Uh, you can have the floor if you have any Elizabeth Holmes, uh, New York Times uh, feature story on Sunday meant to humanize a big giant fraud. If you have any thoughts there, the floor is yours. Well, it, it just journalistic integrity seemed to evaporate within the context of the article. And what I couldn't understand is why why would they run with it when she's writing actively writing that her editor is actively questioning. Yo, it seems like you're kind of in the bag. You've been bamboozled. You've been bamboozled. And it's part of the story. It's to me that seems like just kind of a corrupted piece of content. No. Yeah, it, it's weird. Like I have such conflicting feelings on it because I do feel empathy for anyone who is having to serve a prison sentence, guilty or not. Like the prison system is awful. It is terrible. It is a terrible fate. But at the same time, like for the article not really to mention the effects of any of the harm and any of the victims of the crime almost makes it seem like it was a whoopsie daisy. And like, that's just, that's but, bizarre. But I'm, but I'm asking you whether it's Madoff, whether it's Pharma Bro, whether it's Firefest. Like, why is it so popular to to get out there now with fraud, be a shamelessly fraudulent Stop person. Stop binging the Netflix ahead of my time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and why is it always down here? I mean, I mean we're, <laughs> we're literally part of a show that had a, a fraud on, and he suffered no consequences. Yeah. Thank you. Well, <laughs> what, what should the consequences on Steve Rods be? That's a great question. The next time he pulls that, it's a no. Pulls a what? But... <laughs> <laughs> I just gave you the John Taffer look. You did. It did. You did. Like you were, Wait, let me put a plant in front of you. Yes, me. John Taffer who always looks like there's a giant Christmas tree between you and him when he's talking to you, and he has to lean around it. He has to duck down. There it is. There, there it is. is. There is the plant that you have to move around. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts, I mean, on a couple of basketball things, but I also wanted to get your thoughts on something very age-specific that I think maybe Roy is old soul enough, enough to appreciate this. After 36 years, Stugatz, I don't know if you love music this way enough to be moved in any way towards sadness or nostalgia with the news that MTV News has signed off after 36 year run uh corporatized uh, eliminated i know that many of you think of mtv as only a place where ridiculousness is uh perpetually aired but uh why are you laughing about that's that? an actual show sugats yeah that's an actual uh, show they used to have music on mtv mm -hmm. remember that many many years ago yeah you know, there's music it, videos available for you whenever you Roy, want that now. sounded so ancient i was about to say that that joke is so old that was a joke. They, that joke is too old for MTV now because they used to run that joke like in the 90s and the early 2000s when they said, oh, it's all real world and road rules and real world road rules. Why do you think I said it? I'm sad to see it go because when I was growing up, MTV News did a lot of good things. Serena Alchul? Man, you Who's beat your... me to Serena Alchul. Uh, Gideon Yeago. I had to get in there. Loader. Gideon Yeago. Sway was a part I of it. I thought it stopped in like 2004. I didn't know it was still no, a no. thing. No, <laughs> no. But in a minute, 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 it's oh, a new. Yeah. They used that? to deliver like Chris Conley. Yeah, they used to deliver horrifying news about your favorite rock stars dying. Pre-internet, yeah. Kurt Loder is now seventy-eight years old. If you want to feel Jeez. really, no way. really old, Jeez. get a load oh. of that. Did that movie at all? Like I had no reaction to MTV News, like zero. I mean, ESPN News. You take that away from me, and that's the worst day in the history of my life. What? That's a good joke. ESPN News is like the channel? Oh, I love news. Yeah, ESPN it, News, The it, Wire. It cut through Dan's like fog of like just thinking about how to, where do I take this segment, all that stuff, and it just cut right through it, and, and the clouds parted, and Dan turned and looked at me, and he realized what I said. John Taffer look. <laughs> he did. He did give me a Taffer. <laughs> I mean, get a loader this. <laughs> I do miss Kirk Jimenez talking yeah. to <laughs> Bino Cook and Andrew Goldhammer. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. It had a charm. <laughs> I remember watching Belly, and there, there's a scene in Belly where he's the uh, DMX is in the shower, and he's got a TV in the shower, and then Kurt Loder comes on the TV, and it's like a little box of a TV. TNACB. 